What we doing, folks? Your host, Moose, here on the Pit Panthers Football Network as we welcome you to our Season 5 Week 12 NCAA Recap Show. Of course, your Pit Panthers coming off a fantastic performance against the Duke Blue Devils. 40-13 to the victory, their most comprehensive win of the season. It was really really exacerbated by a fantastic second half 24 unanswered points in the third and fourth quarter for the Panthers it was a beautiful beautiful game Pickett was fantastic throwing the football uh, AC Reese came in and had a nice game as well in relief uh, whenever the Panthers decided to put the second teamers in CJ London a huge day running the football I mean, it was a great game all around Pitt out gaining Duke 518 to 160 and take a look at this AC Reese four completions 65 yards Kenny Pickett 20 for 242 and three touchdowns, so a great day for him. Even though the completion percentage wasn't there, no turnovers, which was huge. CJ London, 113 yards on the ground and a touchdown, which was great to see. Todd Sibley didn't do too much, but you can see the Panthers spread. I think that's 10 different guys that had rushing attempts in the game today. And, of course, on the receiving end, as always, Jay Keys leading the way. Seven catches for 87 yards. He did have four drops, though, which is pretty interesting to see. That was part of a reason why Pitt had so many incompletions was the factor of drops when uh, passes were there, but the player couldn't hold on through contact. And then not only that, but a number of times Duke just had good coverage and were able to knock the ball away. I think they finished with like eight or nine deflections on the game. Now for the Panthers, their leader in deflections was Kai Girardi Scott. He should have had a couple of picks. He did end up with two deflections as well as an interception or excuse me, two deflections as well as a sack and a forced fumble. Uh, the Panthers also had a forced fumble from Barry Jenkins, which was recovered by Sean Wolfgang. So a great game overall for the Panthers. Jay Bump, four for five on field goals. He did miss his first kick of the year from about 46 yards, hooked it to the left, but still a great game from him nonetheless for you know and and the defense was very very good overall you can see the sacks of course helped them out forcing duke into zero rushing yards on the day which is pretty impressive they passed for 160 both under the averages that the panthers typically give up really nice game from the panthers and i mean you don't really have a lot of negatives other than they'd like to have the passing completion percentage a bit higher but how can you really complain when you still pass for over 300 yards and you scored a total of 40 points maybe the four field goals they'd like to have back but it is what it is now besides having a great game on the field not so great off the field for the panthers they missed out on a number of key targets including defensive tackle pat mayo and offensive tackle um nate love both of whom decided to commit elsewhere. So the Panthers now, going to be interesting to see where those scholarships end up going. You can see the top targets still on the Panthers board. Joel Sykes and Calvin Burgess both have scholarships offered to them. They're, they're, they're in battles right now, and the Panthers are trying to convince them to come to the University of Pittsburgh. But the guys Pitt missed out on, you can see defensive tackle Pat Mayo from New Jersey, number eight defensive tackle in the country. Pitt was in a battle with a number of schools, and he decided to commit to Penn State following his visit this past week. But I think the more shocking one had to be Nate Love, the two-star Juco. He had his only Power 5 offer, was from Pitt, an incredible program, but he decided to go to Akron instead. The Juco Jr. currently playing for Lackawanna uh, Junior College up there in Scranton, PA, hanging out with Dwight Schrute. Uh, he decided to go to Akron, so interesting choice there. Maybe he decided to go for the playing time, figuring more than likely even coming as a junior next year, he probably wouldn't start. He'd likely only get one year starting for the Panthers, and so he went elsewhere. Another guy we didn't really have a chance at, but it was a shame we missed on, was Braylon Greer. Maybe should have went after him. UCLA signed him, which means we'll see him next year uh, when we take on the Bruins in a non-conference game. And another guy we'll see next year, though, he'll probably redshirt, Michael Bush, the three-star tight end. Obviously, he wasn't going to come here because of the fact that we signed Nelson, the other tight end, the number three tight end in the country. But he decided to go to Maryland instead. And you see Mayo that we missed out on. He's projected as a 77 right now after 55% scouting. So that's a good player to miss out on, or big player to miss out on. Nate Love ended up being a 74, which, like I said, coming in as a junior means he probably at best would have had one year starting for us. But he was a guy we wanted. You know, he's a guy we had offered a scholarship for. So it's a shame to miss out on those guys, especially when you think they would have helped. Just add depth to the program. You know what I mean? We don't have a ton of great linemen besides our starters. Our backups are have been hit by regression a little bit. So it's been tough. But, you know, it is what it is. Braylon Greer looks like an absolute beast, though. 78 overall, 81 speed as a middle linebacker for UCLA. He's from Charles City, Iowa. And you can see he had a ton of big offers. We didn't, we didn't go after him right from the beginning because we ended up getting Jonathan so well. Of course, the local product from Pittsburgh, PA, from Moon. Uh, so we missed on him. We also missed on Paul Davis, another big defensive tackle. So two defensive tackles decided to go to Penn State. 
that both look very good. 76 overall for Paul Davis, so it's a shame we missed on him. But the good news for us is we get to scout finally and finish scouting the two guys that we signed last week. Phil Nelson, the four-star tight end, number three tight end in the country. And he's a good player. He was projected at 79 overall. He ends up being a 75. So that's a shame. You know, we don't like seeing the minus four. But still, 83 catching already. Uh, he's a good route runner. His spectacular catch is good. He's got good speed for a tight end. His blocking's not great, but more than likely because we'll have three senior tight ends and a junior tight end next year, he's going to redshirt, which means he'll have an opportunity to grow before he gets into the starting lineup. And then C.J. Kirk, the big question mark, we don't have any of his real skill stats right now. We have rushing stats, but that's pretty much it. He has good elusiveness, looks like good break tackling. His carrying's terrible, but oh my word, we found ourselves a gem, and he is a very very intriguing prospect and you can see 89 speed for a quarterback which is incredible he's got good agility as well decent acceleration so he's not he doesn't have the quickest first step but he's a fast player and he's got 85 throw power 78 accuracy so the arm accuracy is something we'll definitely have to work on hopefully that improves but he's got good power already 85 is decent especially for a you know a young recruit you don't typically see guys with with huge throw power because usually they'll grow that in a couple of off seasons but he's got good throw power and his speed is in Incredible 89 speed, so that is certainly going to make things interesting moving into next season when we're going to need a new starting quarterback. He's a guy that's definitely going to be in the mix. 79 overall coming in as a true freshman. Uh, he'll definitely have a part to play. You can see our other quarterback sign was Jesse Coley. He's a 75 overall, so he's a good player. But he just doesn't have the outstanding attributes like Kirk does. Kirk has the speed. Coley has a little bit better accuracy, but he doesn't have the arm strength. So he's more than likely a depth guy that will be good for us to have on the team. You know, compete for some playing time. But I don't think he's potentially uh, of interest to us to be a starter. Now, we do have a few guys that we do offer scholarships to. Chris Massey gets a scholarship off for the defensive end. Outside linebacker Dominic Christian from Altoona, PA. P Pennsylvania product. We want to keep those pipelines strong. Uh, I make it a requirement of myself to have majority PA players on the team. Just most players on the team are from, not most players, but I should say the biggest state that we have players from, that where we have the m most players from, is PA. And so we offer Christian just because outside linebacker is a need for us. He's not a great player projected as a 68, but he's a good player that should fill a job for us. A great game, though. Uh, North Carolina, 46 to 37 of Virginia. North Carolina outstanding offensively and that's who we're gonna have to play this week so that's gonna be a tough game Miami 38 to 34 they score a touchdown with 15 seconds left to beat Georgia Tech to end up keeping their ACC Coastal Division hopes alive they basically have to win out and they need us to lose out if they want to have an opportunity to win the Coastal but they are still alive at this point by beating Georgia Tech now Penn State Probably not alive in the college football playoff race anymore or the Big Ten race. Losing to Ohio State 20-19. The Buckeyes score 13 unanswered points, including 10 in the fourth quarter with the game-winning field goal coming with under a minute to play in Happy Valley. They turned it into very sad valley as the Buckeyes knock off the Nittany Lions in a huge upset there. West Virginia gets a big one over Kansas. Uh, Cal knocks off Auburn. Take a look at that. 31-28. to The Golden Bears come into Jordan-Hare Stadium and come away with a victory. Cal has been incredible this season. Vera Monte struggles in this game. Uh, Stephen Davis played very well, though, for Auburn in the loss. Another big rank tilt. South Carolina wins in overtime. Rico Dowdell, Heisman, dark horse yet again. Three touchdowns for him as South Carolina knocks off Clint Franklin, the quarterback of Florida, and the Gators 44-38 in overtime. And the Gators now likely out of the college football picture as well. Army sticks with one loss. They go to 10-1 with a win over Tulsa. Houston keeps on rolling as they knock off USF. Ole Miss escapes Tulane. Huge game for Louisville beating Wake Forest and Jawan passes Heisman hopes. And another gigantic rank battle. Oregon State falls for the second time this season. They lose on the road in Seattle taking on Washington. The Huskies behind a fantastic performance from Sean McGrew. Four touchdowns for the senior halfback and they come with a win while Alabama stays unbeaten as well knocking off Mississippi State. Over in the Player of the Week honors B, uh, TCU quarterback Brennan Wooten. Six touchdowns, 403 yards. He's a guy that's definitely in the Heisman consideration. Another big game for him as they beat Texas Tech. And Tavante Beckett wins NCAA Player of the Week and ACC Player of the Week honors. A sack, two forced fumbles, bunch of tackles for Virginia Tech. And Josh Jackson with a great game at quarterback for them wins ACC Offensive Player of the Week. Heisman race still led by Jawan Pass, who had a gigantic game in their victory. Brennan Wooten up to second overall. 
Artavis Pierce, who had a nice game in their loss to Washington for Oregon State. Rico Dowdell up to fourth now, and Ian Wells from Army still hanging around after another huge performance for him, but Jawan passed the guy to beat after another 400-yard, like, four or five touchdown performance for Louisville, who climbs up to number 10 now. They're 10-1. and one. They're, they're not going to make uh, the... ACC championship game, but they're going to have a great season regardless. Washington jumps up to number six in the polls with their victory over Oregon State. They actually leapfrogged Pitt, who goes up to number seven. Penn State falls all the way back to number eight after losing to Ohio State. And I'm surprised Ohio State didn't come up further. I know they were ranked low, but they only jumped three spots up to number 13 in the coaches' poll, despite beating who was number two in the country in Penn State. So interesting to see that they don't get too big of a bump. Same with teams like West Virginia, 8-1, and one, they just smoked Kansas, they're still only number 21. Not a lot of respect for a few of these one-loss teams here throughout the country. Now, if you feel like pausing at any point to see where your favorite school might be heading this bowl season, take a look as we go through it. This is the first projections for where teams will be going bowling. You see Pitt right now projected to play in the Chick-fil-A Bowl in what would be a fun matchup against Auburn. Number one, because they're a very rush-heavy team, so it'd be a different style than we typically play against, and we usually struggle against rush-heavy teams, so it'd be fun. Plus, they got great uniforms. It'd be a fun bowl game for the history, even though Auburn hasn't been particularly good. As it stands right now, you can see Clemson's projected to win the ACC, so they got TCU in the Orange Bowl. That's why we're not in the Orange Bowl. Uh, and I'm surprised we didn't get a BCS at-large bid, or not BCS, college football playoff uh, at-large bid to one of the other bowls. But you got Ohio State, Cal as the Pac-12 team, uh, South Carolina, Penn State, Oklahoma, Washington. Then your national championship right now is the two lone unbeatens, Houston and Alabama, though things could certainly shake up. And, of course, keep in mind, we'll have four teams competing in the college football playoff. As it stands right now for the Coastal, we're pretty much a shoe in uh, unless we lose both of our final two games and Miami wins both their final two games. Clemson is, uh, has already clinched the Atlantic because they only have one conference game left. And even if they lose it, they already have the tiebreaker over Louisville because of a head-to-head -head victory over them. So Clemson will be in the ACC championship game from the Atlantic division, and they'll more than likely be facing your Pitt Panthers for the third time in five seasons. Of course, remember season one, Clemson got the better of us, came away with a victory. We got the best of them in season three in a thoroughly dominating performance. And now we'll get the rubber match likely here in season five. So every other year it's Pitt and Clemson. We're pretty excited for that uh, in a couple of weeks as long as we can take care of business here moving forward. Now you look around the country, some big, big games though. 8-1 West Virginia goes into Norman to take on number three in the coaches poll, 7-2 Oklahoma. I'm surprised Oklahoma's ranked so high, to be honest, because they do have two losses, but they will be taking on West Virginia in what should be a fantastic contest. Oklahoma, they always have the talent from their recruiting classes, but West Virginia's been very, very good this year. Take a look at that. Number three defense in the country. Oklahoma, number seven defense in the country. It's not often you see that from Big 12 schools, so that should actually be potentially a defensive battle, which should be pretty fun. You've got NC State taking on Louisville. Alabama goes to Texas A&M. Should be a great matchup. Another test for Alabama because Texas A&M has a very good team. They've also got one of the better passing offenses in the country going against Alabama, who has a notoriously stingy defense, of course. That should be a great showdown to really test the number one team in the country who still has Auburn on the schedule as well. So they got some tough challenges moving forward. Every game is basically a playoff game for them. Northwestern taking on Wisconsin. The winner will likely make the Big, uh, Big Ten championship game uh, based on head-to-head. -head. If Wisconsin wins, if Northwestern wins, they're pretty much going to win the Big t uh, Ten West outright. Wisconsin always a good team, but Northwestern's really overachieved this year. Their only loss this season was to Ohio State by a field goal. So they've, they're that close to being unbeaten, which you know how well they'd be ranked if that was the case. So uh, I like Northwestern in that game, but it should be a fun contest. Auburn, LSU, two teams that had really high expectations, but are now just playing in a, in a meaningless SEC game, but still one that will be two really good teams. Washington, Oregon should be a great game. Oregon's out of it for the, retaining the Pac-12 championship, but they could knock uh, derail Washington's hopes. That's for sure. We get a de facto Sun Belt championship game between Troy and Arkansas State. I'd expect Arkansas State to win. Look how good their defense is. Number one in the country, 275 yards against a game. That's absurdity. It's even better than our defense was last year, which was one of the top two defenses in the country. Florida actually has the number two defense in the country this year. Eight and two, they're taking on number 18, Missouri, in what should be a great game, despite the fact that both of those teams have lost in recent weeks. They've still been very good. And finally, your Pitt Panthers at home, senior night for so many memorable players from this series. Kenny Pickett, the senior quarterback, the most notorious one. 
it should be a great game because UNC is a very, I don't know how they're three and seven, one and five in conference. Look how good their team is. They're better rated than we are. They have a great offense um, yardage wise. They can score points, but their defense has just been so bad this year, especially against the pass. And that's an area where we'll really look to exploit them with Kenny Pickett, who's if he throws for 323 yards, he'll be over 3,000 for the season, which will be fantastic to see. He's done a nice job uh, protecting the football. You can see our rushing attack hasn't been great, but London's been good lately. Jay Keys is only 29 yards away from 1,000 for the season. He's closing in. Larry Fitzgerald had the record for most catches in a season with 92. Jay Keys could get there depending on how many games we have left. We will be missing, and Keys will get some more opportunities because we will be missing Benjamin Ogden. Uh, he's our number three receiver. He'll be out for three weeks, which will leave him out for the end of the regular season and potentially out for the uh, uh, conference championship game as well with a back injury, which means K.J. Welsh will get a bit more time uh, in his stead. And if you look at North Carolina, I mean, they're a pretty good team. Look at their losses. They've all been fairly close. Other than the Georgia Tech game where they got beaten pretty handily, same with Louisville, every other game they've been within six points, three points, one point, seven points. I mean, they've been very, very close. You spin a couple of those games around, and they could end up being a seven and three football team, and this would be a whole different story. They'd even be in the mix potentially to go to the ACC championship game because their team is really, really good, as we're going to see. They're missing a couple of guys. They're number one halfback who they're missing, but it doesn't even phase them. If you look at the halfbacks they have, it's absolutely incredible uh, that they're going to be missing a, a guy who's very, very good on their team, and it's not even going to phase them one bit. Look at this roster. Half the teams we go through in the ACC, they're down out of the 80s after 10 players. North Carolina, half their roster is 80 or better. They're fantastic. I mean, they're just really, really solid all around. Chaz Surratt at quarterback. The one thing that they'll miss, I was going to say that they're going to be a, a huge potential ACC favorite next year even, but they don't really have a quarterback. Um, their quarterback next year will be probably like 78 overall. Chaz Surratt this year, 93 speed. 92 overall. He can run. He's very, very good. So we'll have to watch out. Look at him at halfback. They got four halfbacks at 84 or better, and they're all in different years. They got two seniors in Austin Richard and uh, the guy who's injured as well. And Richard averaging 86 yards a game. Surratt's off averaging, I think, 67 yards a game from the quarterback position rushing. And then Sam O'Donnell behind him. He's a junior. He'll be their starting running back next year. He's 94 speed. He's averaging 40 yards a game. So they got like 180 yards per game. 190 even close to 200 from those three guys who are absolutely deadly and they even have guys a sophomore and a freshman or excuse me two sophomores or a, a sophomore and a redshirt freshman at 84 overall so they are set for the next three or four years at running back for sure the big guy we're gonna have to watch out for is jared wade jared wade's incredible he did really well against us last year he's their number one receiver 96 speed he's a burner 89 overall he'll be here next year as well he's a redshirt junior so if he stays for next year he's gonna be a guy we'll really have to watch out for they got akeem reed they got marcus Barron. Look at that just core of receivers. They have Garrett Walston at tight end, 89 overall, 87 speed. That's a just danger at tight end. Jason Jordan, our uh, senior captain outside linebacker, will have to cover him well uh, to help and limit what he's able to do because I think he scored against us last year, if I do remember correctly. Their line is good, too. Trey Washington's a junior, 89 overall. I mean, they have high 80s, maybe 170-some guy and a low 80 guy in their line. I mean, they're incredible. Um, I don't know how they're three and seven. You look at this roster, Joe Wilson, 93 as a true senior. So he's had incredible growth. That means he came in as a very high 70s. Their leading sack guy, he's fantastic. Tomon Fox, redshirt senior. He doesn't have great stats, but he's got a good overall. They're a little weak at defensive tackle. Darnell Meeks, Gene Williams, Patrick Roberts, but they got some big bodies. They'll plug up the middle. Hopefully we can open some holes there. Um, Linebackers interesting because their outside linebackers aren't great. Jason Williams, Johnny Garcia, but they're going to be playing Tyrone Hopper, an outside linebacker, because Johnny Garcia is hurt. He's a 90 overall with 81 speed. He can play outside linebacker no problem. Um, and then they, of course, they have Jonathan Smith, 96 overall middle linebacker. Their lineup is ridiculous. And they have good speed, too, at their defense, which is what you want to see uh, to be able to play well. Look at their corners. They got two really good.
cover corners in Doherty and KJ Sales. I mean, KJ Sales did really well against us last year. I remember him being a, a, a dominant force defensively for them in the nickel. Then they got Doherty on the outside as well. Four interceptions for him. Great speed. So those are going to be guys that are tough matchups for the likes of Jay Keys to find any room to work with. But he always seems to do it every game. It's just a matter of time. Desi Stanley, John Pratt. I mean, those depth guys even have good speed and are good players. Pierre King, one of my favorite names in the entire NCAA. This guy is a beast. I wish he was on our team. I wish I'd have recruited him. He's from Ohio. That's a pipeline state for us, so I could have looked at him, but Pierre King, alas, did not come to us. What a great player. And even their kicking game's good. They got Kane and Brooks at kicker and punter, both 89 and 95 overall. I mean, their whole team is stacked. I don't understand how they're three and seven. Uh, we'll see how they come out and play. They always seem to have a very offense-oriented attack in that they just come out slinging. They pass the ball. They don't settle for screens and stuff like that. They throw it deep. They like to, to mix up their intermediate routes. So it's going to be a tough game. There's no doubt about that. Let me know in the comments who you think is going to win, what's going to be the final score, and send, can we send the seniors out from their last game at Heinz Field? with a victory let me know what's gonna happen some of the other big games around the country will anybody get knocked off this week and as always thanks for watching guys hail to pit we'll see you soon take care bye bye